Good evening. Welcome to Bible study at Full View Missionary Baptist Church. We're awfully glad that you joined us this evening. We're continuing our Bible study on unity. We're hoping that people in this world will hear this word and begin to think along a unified fashion, which is what, what God wants from us. That's what he requires of us. Are we living up to his requirements? Join me in the attitude of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your word today. Even on a hot summer day, God, the dog days of summer, we know you're with us. You're between every drop of sweat, Lord. You keep us safe. We ask today, God, that you look in on those who have to work out in the weather and in the heat. We ask today, God, that you look in on the Commonwealth of Kentucky and other places that are suffering from natural disasters, or from rain and flood or fire out west. We ask, God, that you look in on the people of Ukraine and all over this world that are still struggling under war. Thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. Thank you for what it means to us. Thank you for the story of the book of Acts about the spread of the church. And help us, God, to help continue to spread the word of our bringing people into relationship with you. Lord, we thank you today for all that you do, even those things that we don't understand. We trust you, God, and know that you're with us, you're for us, and we thank you for being our God and allowing us and selecting us to be your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Amen. We are still in the time and the days of Pentecost here as we move into the month of August this month. Is your soul on fire for God? If you stay outside, you sure feel like you're on fire. It's hot out there, so be careful. Drink plenty of water. Uh, still don't take too much of the world's power right now because electricity is in limited supply, so try to turn on your fans if you have to, uh, and, and that way you can take a few of the degrees of your air conditioning, turn it up a little bit higher, but above all, keep hydrated and stay cool. So as you look at tonight, we're continuing in the book of Acts. We're going to be talking a little bit more continuing from where we left off last week with the sixth chapter and moving into the seventh chapter. We're looking at the writings of the beloved physician Luke. As we've talked earlier, he's done a fabulous job of being an investigative reporter. Luke is writing in the early 60th, uh, 60 years after the beginning of the Common Era or AD Anno Dominio. Uh, it is uh, about 30, oh, coming up on about 25 to 30 years after the death of Christ. And what we're finding here is a lot of things that Jesus had predicted have already occurred. The second temple that was remodeled during Herod the Great's time has already been destroyed. The country is in political turmoil. Herod the Great may have been, some historians and theologians believe, poisoned. He had done so much he'd actually murdered two to three of his own sons and uh, about two to three of his wives who were mothers of some of those sons. He'd not trained anyone to succeed him. So the country had been split into three different parts to continue to be a vassal state of the Roman Empire. Each of those parts was given to one of his sons, some of them half-brothers, and we start looking at that. We know ourselves that quite often when we are children born to a plural family, meaning, you know, one singular parent or multiple separate parents, be it mother or father, quite often it makes it even more difficult to get along. We can look at the example of the household of Jacob to see one example, the household of David, and we see this being a continuing challenge in our society today. So there's all this political turmoil going on in Israel right now. Everybody's got their own politics. You have the ruling Sanhedrin council that Luke talks about a lot in the book of Acts and in his gospel. They have their beliefs about how their faith in God should be practiced. You've got the Sadducees who do not believe in life after death. They had challenged Jesus with that and tried to entrap him by asking him whose wife would a woman who, who uh, had been married to seven different brothers, whose wife would she be in heaven? And Jesus reminded them that nobody's really going to be focusing on things like that as we get to heaven. Uh, we've got all these zealots running around who always believed that the Messiah was going to come and form an army and overthrow the Roman government. There are people from all over the Jewish diaspora, all over the known world, 
There's a huge Greek audience that we talked about last week, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more tonight. And so all of this turmoil is what's going on here, and it's causing problems to even intensify above what was already usual in Judea, because the Jewish people were a tough audience. They had their own ideas about things. They tolerated a lot from the Romans, but a lot they didn't tolerate. They did not allow worship of Caesar. They didn't allow the Roman eagle or their standard that they marched behind into battle and used in all their ceremonies to be flown in most parts of Jerusalem and certainly not within visual or on the property of the temple. And so we're sitting here looking at all this turmoil. It is a cauldron. And Luke, the physician, a compatriot of Paul, uh, formerly known as Saul, is writing to record how the Holy Spirit acted in guiding believers through the spread of the Word of God, introducing more and more people to Jesus Christ and helping them know that he was our Savior, he is our Savior, he is the Messiah, he had been crucified, dead, and buried, and risen, and spent time with his followers and believers, and then had ascended into heaven. So that background tells us where we're going. We're continuing to talk about unity amidst transition. Life is about movement a lot of times. God is often moving us from one place to another, one job to another, one set of uh, situation to another. A new government comes in quite often as we're in the middle of election season here. And we hope that you are exercising your God-given right to vote. Many people for decades in our country died for the right to vote. There's a lot of contention going on right now in this country and in different parts of the world about do people get the right to voice who leads their governments. So as we look at this transition that's going on in this scripture tonight, when I put this slide together in front of you, I still mentioned that we were in Acts uh, 5 and 6 from last week. We're going to take a look again at a little bit of, the, of chapter 6, but we're really most of our time tonight will be spent in Stephen's sermon in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. Remember that temptation is ever-present, especially during times of church growth from righteous things being done. It's real easy to find yourself in a crowd and do some really scurrilous and crazy things. Remember the Hebrews got in the crowd when the 12 spies got back from spying out the land, and it was the people's idea. They took it to Moses, and he thought it was a good idea, but it wasn't. Because when the 12 spies came back, despite all of God's miracles, despite how many signs God had given them, and how many times God had been with them, even all the 12 plagues of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and drowning of the Egyptian army, the people still didn't believe that God leading them through a cloud in the daytime and a fire at night could take them into the promised land and conquer the people there and give them the land. It's real easy to get in a crowd. Uh, Dr. King reminded us that often in a crowd, it's really easy to be immoral. So when you find yourself in a crowd and people are getting alarmed, be calm. Trust God. Remember whose we are and who we are. The point we're teaching tonight is time to know and embrace our heritage. We come from a people who have been brought what? A mighty long way. It's real easy to forget that on hot days like today, in times of turmoil in this world today. It's really easy to forget that we have survived world wars and domestic terrorism for millennia and decades. It's really easy to forget how God has delivered us over and over. And when I look at this, the sermon of Stephen tonight, and he recapsulated 400 years of Hebrew history in such an artful fashion, I think about 400 years of history in this country and what some of the people that look like me and even those that don't look like me have suffered in this country because evil knows no flesh. And whether we want to like it or not, we have far more in common with each other everywhere in this country, whether it be black, brown, white, red, yellow, whatever hue in between, we have a lot more in common than we do not. Our purpose tonight is that we need to look at ourselves. It's good to know our strengths. And Deacon Mandrell and I were talking earlier about 
it's even better sometimes to know our weaknesses. What is it that God has gifted us with and where is it that he's still working in our lives to improve us to be better persons, better servants of God, better servants of each other? That's what this scripture is about tonight. Remember, Stephen was a deacon, and deacon means to serve. And I guarantee you that anything you're doing today in the name of God, our number one thing is we need to focus on being a servant to God and to our fellow brothers and sisters in this world, not just in Christ, but in this world. So let's continue to dive in here. We take a look as we did last night. We remind our, last week we remind ourselves that Paul is in this crowd and he's on the wrong side. When history looks back at us, which side will we have been on? Will history be kind to us and our reputation and our actions? Or will we have found ourselves at a need to be repentant for the things we're doing right now. Here's what Paul said later in Acts 22 and 3, we remind from what we shared last week. I am a Jew born in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia, but I grew up here in Jerusalem where I was a student of Gamaliel and was taught to follow every single law of our ancestors. In fact, I was just as eager to obey God as any of you today. Last week and the week before, we reminded you that Gamaliel was the equivalent of the dean of, of uh, academics uh, the, you know, at, a, at a major college that bore his name. He was like the president and founder of the school. Paul quite often cited that he came through uh, the school of Gamaliel to be trained as a Pharisee. Gamaliel showed up when they arrested the 12 apostles for teaching about Jesus and healing people. Can you imagine getting arrested for healing people? Happens all the time. Dr. King got arrested for healing people. Mahatma Gandhi got arrested for healing people. Okay? And Gamaliel told those folks to leave these men alone. If it's of God, you don't want to oppose God. If it's not of God, it won't succeed. And what did they do as soon as they brought the apostles back in? They had them beaten. They really didn't listen to Gamaliel. And here is Paul obviously at that time named Saul, which is Saul in Hebrew and Paul in the Greek. I tell people all the time, if your name is James, remember you are, the, you are named after a prophet. James in Greek is, is Jacob in Hebrew. And so here's a man who learned so much from Gamaliel that God would use later to spread the church and write, for sure we know seven books, of the, uh, of, of, of the Judeo-Christian New Testament Bible. In question, there's another seven that theologians debate over whether or not Paul wrote those. So out of the books of the New Testament, Paul is credited with either writing definitely seven and another seven, maybe a surrogate wrote in his name, or perhaps it was Paul. But here's a person who did all that great work later on, and yet the main person who was his mentor and teacher, as he gave him good advice, Saul did not follow that advice. So quite often we get good advice. We hear great sermons taught. We had a strong sermon on Sunday taught, and a lot of the material that uh, Reverend Purifor spoke on on Sunday is what we're going to be covering tonight in Stephen's speech. So let's dive right in. Last week we left off with people lying on an angel. We have heard him claim that Jesus from Nazareth would destroy this place and change the customs Moses gave us, the contemporary English version said. In King James it said, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. That is an absolute untruth and no other way to say it. It's a bald-faced lie. That is not what Stephen said. That is not what Jesus said. It is amazing how people get in court and they lie. And they get out of court and they lie. And lying is not a new thing. And I've said to people here lately, if you know you have a bad habit of not telling the truth, try to talk less, baby. Okay? Until you can work on that habit and continue to let God work on that in you. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, 
saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Then all the council members, the, the contemporaneous version says, stared at Stephen. They saw that his face looked like the face of an angel. Did that stop them from being mad at him? Nope. Did his theology agree with theirs? No, it didn't. Did it form concisely with what they believed the relationship with God and his followers ought to be? No, it didn't. And did it concern them that their system to handle welfare and the needs of the poor had broken down because they didn't have enough money to feed even their own priests? We talked last week that Josephus said priests were starving. So this is a real difficult time of need in the whole Jerusalem, Judeo, growing Christian community. And instead of people getting glad that Stephen is able to more fairly and efficiently and effectively distribute food and nobody in the Christian community is going without, they were what? Angry. Because too often we find ourselves less concerned about people's needs and more concerned about the needs of our ego, okay? So that's what's going on in this crowd. That's who's leading it. This is the Sanhedrin, the leading council. They're looking at this man with this angelic face, and they know he's been successful. He is gifted spiritually. He's making speeches. He's teaching. He is literally healing people like the 12 were, the 12 apostles were, and yet they're still angry at him. So as we shift now to chapter 7, we get into Stephen's speech. It is one of the longest addresses in uh, the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, it is the longest in the book of Acts. Of all the Pauline uh, sermons and those teachings of uh, Peter and John that we pick up at different times and other followers of Jesus later in the book of Acts, this sermon of Stephen stands alone in its entirety of the history of the Hebrew nation. As we look at this, this is a person that knows the Bible very well, the Old Testament. He perhaps grew up studying the Septuagint, which was the uh, Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew Bible that had been done in ancient Egypt. They said it was done in 70 days uh, by 70 scholars, and so because of that, they called it the Septuagint. This guy knew his stuff. He knew whose he was. He knew he was a son of God. He knew he was a Hellenistic, a Greek-speaking, culture-bearing Jew from somewhere up in that part of the diaspora, and yet he knows about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the ups and downs and travails and successes and failures of his Hebrew history. The high priest asked Stephen, are they telling the truth about you? Sometimes when people ask you a question, right, they really don't want to hear the answer. It's, did Boy, did Stephen give them an answer. Let's look in. Stephen answered, friends, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. That's Iraq, y'all. Before he had moved to Haran, that's Turkey. God told him, leave your country and your relatives and go to a land that I will show you. Then Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. Like Reverend Purifor preached on Sunday, uh, he was still with his family folks, wasn't he? He was still with his dad. His dad hadn't died. He was still around all his in-laws and outlaws. Yeah, I did say outlaws, okay? And as Pure Ford talked on Sunday, uh, God needed to move him again because he couldn't see the vision. Because sometimes it's just difficult to be around family folks, okay? I talked to a friend of mine last week, and he was up in the mountains somewhere. I won't say work, or somebody might know where he went and know who I'm talking about. But he was on vacation with a lot of in-laws, and everybody was fighting. And I said, dude, what are you doing? He said, I'm just sitting there looking at all these beautiful mountains that God has made, and, and I'm at peace, and I'm going to let them sit there and, and have their battles and fights, and I'm going to praise the Lord right up here in these hills, okay? So after his father died, Abraham came and settled this land where you now live. In the King James, in, in uh, verse 5, it says, And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Well, guess what? He had no child, but God promised the land to him. 
He wandered all over the land as a sojourner. He was a trespasser. Everywhere he went, he didn't own where he was. And yet he had thousands of cattle and, you know, donkeys and goats and sheep and camels with him. He had hundreds of people that were enslaved to him. He was a powerful man. He had a private army. When Lot was kidnapped by the five kings from down in uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham split his forces, went north into the north, uh, middle, northwestern part of the country, and performed a very skilled military raid and took back all of the things that those kings, raiding kings, had stolen. And yet here's a man who did not own where he lived. And quite often, as he dug a well, it became contested, and he'd have to move on rather than to cause problems with those that lived in the land. So Stephen knows about Abram's faith. He was still called Abram at that time and later changed to Abraham. And we dive deeper into what Stephen is preaching here this morning. This is a man of God. This is a sermon. He is a minister. We quite often want to forget that whatever it is we're doing for God, we are ministers. And a deacon is a minister. And a trustee is a minister. And a janitor in the church is a minister. If you don't believe me, try to go to the bathroom and the janitor hadn't been by lately, okay? You'll be warning him or her to come by and minister to you. And I was looking at my retirement statement the other day from Social Security and thanking God because the first time they took Social Security out in the name of Dwight Anthony Fryer with my Social Security number, I was a janitor, okay? And I did a good job like Dr. King said do. I was a good street sweeper. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Does that sound familiar to 400 years of evil? Hmm, okay. Some folks want to roll that dial back, don't they? Ain't happening. Don't worry about it. Didn't nobody go back to Egypt either. Some of them wanted to, but no, it ain't happening. God said Abraham's descendants would live for a while in a foreign land. There they would be slaves and would be mistreated 400 years. But he also said, I will punish the nation that makes them slaves. Then later, they will come and worship me in this place. God said to Abraham, every son in each family must be circumcised to show you have kept your agreement with me. So when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him. Later, Isaac circumcised his son, Jacob, and Jacob circumcised his 12 sons. These men were our ancestors. Going back to the King James, it says, and the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. It's amazing what we do sometimes just because we're envious, okay? Nothing new about it. it happened then, guess what? It's still happening now. We just need to make sure it's not us, okay? We're, we're in humankind. We can't seem to break that habit, but we need to make sure that we're not the ones doing it. God says what? Don't covet even a man's, uh, I think it was she ass or something like that. Don't covet anything that anyone has. And he goes through a whole laundry list of possibilities. That still applies to us today. You walk over to somebody's house and they got a big, nice house, don't be jealous, don't be player hating, because they got a nice ride, a nice house, a nice car, a pretty wife, a handsome husband, uh, whatever it is they got. Don't hate, don't be jealous. So where did Abraham travel from? As Reverend Purifor taught on Sunday during Sunday worship, you see on the right this gold line as it moves from right up into the north with the arrow showing his movement, leaving from Babylon, or a modern day Iraq, up into Turkey, which is Haran. Then later after the death of his father, he went down into Canaan. There became a drought, and everybody that did agriculture and anything related to that, they couldn't work, so everybody got downsized. So to keep from dying, Abraham took his wife, and Reverend Purford taught it very well on Sunday. He went down, and he couldn't see the vision and trust God, and he had his wife lie. And Pharaoh took his wife Sarai, later Sarah, 
And but before he lay with her, God cursed Pharaoh and made him give her back and gave him wealth and gave him a slave woman from down in Egypt, which is in Africa. And her name was Hagar, and she bore Abraham a son because it wasn't what God promised. That wasn't a vision God gave, but quite often we'll do some stuff that God didn't tell us to do, and then we wonder why it doesn't work well. And they still fight over this in the Middle East and all over the world today about the this two sons that those two women had. So this is the travels of Abraham that Stephen is doing from memory now. He has no notes. He's not standing at a lectern. There's no computer sitting in front of him like I have sitting in front of me. This guy is just rolling. He knows the Bible very well. It's our job to know the Bible very well. It's our job to teach our children these stories about our heritage and about what's at stake and about how far God has brought us. Quite often we live so good today and our children forget you know, if you're African American, 150 years ago, it was against the law for us to know how to read and write. And I want to rent my clothes when I meet children today, and their parents aren't ensuring that they know how to read. Jim Jr. and May D. used to make us read to them. Didn't have to make me, okay? My older brother had taught me to read at four and a half years old. The teacher used to take me over to the school when I was five and have me read to the first graders because they were struggling with reading. They didn't have Jim Jr. and Mary D. and my big brother James Earl at the house, okay? We need to be making sure our children know how to read. That's on us. We need to know how far God has brought us and how privileged it is that we have some of the things right in front of us today. We got an oligopoly building, a major 5,000 worker plant 20 minutes from this church. Are we getting our 8th graders, 9th graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12-year-old, 12th uh, graders, 20-year-olds ready to go up and claim some of that milk and honey that Ford's going to be passing out? How are they going to get there? How are they going to be prepared for that? What type of education do they need? We got time to get that done over the next several years. There are programs all over that are being prepared to be taught for free. God can only do so much, and then we have to do the rest. So back on this, yeah, when I grew up and I was a boy, I saw these scenes. And I asked us over and over, do we remember, like Stephen did, do we ensure that our children know how far we've become? And do we remember Rosa Parks when they wouldn't let us sit in the, in the front of the bus? I grew up watching this stuff. I didn't sit in the back of nothing in those you know, late 60s, early 70s. It was my form of civil disobedience. After classes were integrated in the schools I went to, if the teacher didn't make me sit in the back because of the alphabet and the way she made out the roster where we sat, I always came in and sat in the front row, okay? And if the teacher, when I got to college, wouldn't talk to me, I tried to schedule some time with them. If they said they were too busy, I real nicely and politely reminded them that, well, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I have some questions, and isn't it your job to help me? So, you know, I, I need to know when your office hours are, and all of a sudden then, he was able to talk to me in class, okay? Uh, we need to talk like this to our children, and remember, yeah, just like anybody else, I can grow up to be a man and a woman, I can grow up to be an adult, and we, we, we know what happened on this balcony on the right. We know that Dr. King was sacrificed, and yet too often, we don't live up to the merits of the sacrifice. How is it that we don't know that our 20-year-old has an automatic weapon that's military grade. And what is he doing with that? Why does he need it? Is he really ready to wield that power? I know I couldn't have it 20. I wouldn't want to walk around now with a machine gun like Prince talked about in Sign of the Times, smoking crack, being a member of whatever it is he's a member of, and toting a machine gun. It's just not a good time to do stuff like that any time. And certainly it's happening too often today. I'm simply speaking about what I think Stephen was talking about. It's time for us to be unified like the people that followed Abraham were unified, like the Hebrews coming out of Egypt were unified, like the folks that followed David when they expanded the kingdom were unified. It's just Hebrew history. And so what's the history of this world and these United States? What's the history of our families and how they overcame? As I looked at Bill Russell's life this week, and I thought about the stories of his family, 
of how they couldn't get it done in Louisiana. So his daddy had to vision it up and take the whole family to Northern California. After being in Louisiana, his mother walked down the street in a nice dress and a, a, a man who happened to be white said, you need to take that dress home and take it off because that's a white woman's dress. I'm sure when they got to California, they didn't have that problem. But Bill Russell still grew up in a very segregated society, was drafted by Boston uh, Celtics in Boston, Massachusetts. You know, we get a bad name for this in the South, but we have a whole lot of divisive problems all over this country and this world. And Bill Russell was racially ostracized throughout his career. He played for 13 years, played in the championship game 12 times, and won the championship 11 times. I guarantee you it will never be repeated. When I was a boy, Bill Russell was the man. They were going to win it every year, okay? I don't even remember exactly which year they didn't win it, uh, the two years, but you know, maybe it was a little bit before I was born when I was too little to remember, but this guy knew about excellence. He knew about being very good with the gifts and graces that God had given him. And he did what Dr. King told us to do. He was the best at what he could do. So what is it, what's your assignment that God has given you? God had given Stephen an assignment to teach and to preach and to heal that sprung out of being a deacon to serve the tables. Where is it that God wants us to expand our territory and do things that are greater? You know, a friend of mine's dad, uh, Roscoe McVeigh, uh, uh, the father of Kevin McVeigh and the wife of uh, Delilah, Barbie McVeigh, Ms. Ms. Delilah grew up in this church decades ago. Both of them have gone on to uh, their grace with the Lord like Stephen does at the end of his speech. He was there when Dr. King preached his last sermon on April 3rd at Mason Temple. And my friend Kevin says, Daddy came home and said, you know old King preached his funeral tonight. And guess what? He did. And every day we walk up and down the grounds of our lives and we treat, preach our funerals. And Will they tell the truth about us at our funerals, or will they get up and lie and, and make things like they were all right? Uh, here we still got this picture of this ivy tree in my yard. I forgot to tell you that this is like my dear uh, salad bar. They come by quite often, that's why that bare spot's in the middle. I got two stumps. One, I kind of left intentionally because the deer like to come by when the leaves sprout out again from that stump, and quite often, you know, we find stumps all over our lives, and God can re-sprout the life into anything, even into our own hearts. So today, stay connected. If you're not connected, reconnect. Make sure that God will sprout you out green and visible again, and have hope. Despite what this world is doing to you, maybe they're standing there with some rocks, they're pounding back and forth in their hand. Perhaps, uh, no matter how angelic your motives and your, and your things are and your face is, Maybe they're lying on you like they did on Stephen, but still hold on to God's word like Stephen did in his sermon tonight. Those little baby deer are still running around in my yard. My wife took an adorable new picture of them that I'm going to bring and share next week. I know it's them because one of them has that little blonde patch in his picture on the left. They're sneaking around. They're doing a little bit better at what mama tells them to do, and they're following directions a little bit better to stay hidden when they're, when they're supposed to. She's not bringing them around the big crowd yet because they're still too young and, you know, deer can be mighty vicious. You ever seen a deer fight? They get pretty tough on each other and they are very good athletes. So we see them nursing here in the lower uh, right corner. Remember, whatever it is you're doing, follow God's instructions. And what's the main commandment Jesus gave us? Be loving. Love God by showing how much you love each other. Okay, back on our word, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. He's talking about Joseph, y'all. And there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Chanan and great affliction, and our fathers found no substance. Downsizing again. Don't be worried about uh, a recession. I've probably lived through about five or seven or eight of them in my adult lifetime now. And every time I thought I was going to turn into a tumbleweed and blow away, it didn't happen. Uh, I didn't say we didn't have a recession. We did, but I didn't die and blow away. 
and all my fortunes didn't get taken. And even though things may have gotten a little tough, two of those I got downsized in a recession. But God is still faithful. And if God is faithful, we need to stay faithful. I don't see a recession right now. Interest rates are higher. They probably need to be to make us spend a little bit less. One somebody asked me recently, why is it that we're raising uh, interest rates to lower inflation? Well, if people can borrow easily, they'll spend more. If they borrow at a higher price to borrow, then you'll spend a little less if, you, if you're spending, you, you, all your money comes from borrowing. So bottom line is, if you want a job now, you can get one. There are so many jobs out there right now. They're worried old fellow like me. They're calling the house. They're emailing me. They're texting me. They got my numbers out there in the databases. And they still want me to come back to work. Praise the Lord. I ain't had to do it. You know, I've done a little consulting since I've been off work. But now I'm at the house with Sister Fryer every day with Reverend Fryer. And we're having a grand time watching the deer prance all over the yard and reminiscing about how good God has been. So, but if you want a job, you can get a job right now. And with that many people working and unemployment down at just 3.6%, we are not at a recession. God is continuing to show he's faithful. Yeah, the price of gas is high. And if you want a pork chop like I talked about last week, you're going to pay a little bit more for it. But it's nice to be able to buy one. And if you can buy one, be thankful. And maybe, I don't know about you, but I've been buying a few less pork chops lately, and that's been a good thing, okay? Now, uh, let's see here. But when Jacob heard that there was corn, meaning grain, in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. In uh, the contemporary English, it said, it was on their second trip that Joseph told his brothers who he was. And the king learned about Joseph's family. What uh, Stephen didn't say was, they meant it for his bad, but God meant it for what? His good. Don't worry about these folks that done bad stuff to you. They meant it for you bad, but guess what? It was for you good. Joseph sent for his father and his relatives, and all there were three score and ten. A score is twenty. Abraham Lincoln talked about four score and ten. Here we're talking about three score and fifteen. Seventy-five folks came in, two million folks came out. Four hundred thousand African Americans were recorded to have been kidnapped and enslaved here in this country. Four million came out per the 1860 slave schedules that were counted of how many African Americans were enslaved in 1860, just before the Civil War began. Moses was born. His father went to Egypt and died there, just as our ancestors did. Later their bodies were taken back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought from the sons of Hamor. Some theologians point out that Stephen made an error. Maybe he didn't make an error. Uh, Jacob was actually entombed at first at the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham and the other patriarchs and matriarchs had been. Uh, his favorite wife, Rachel, had been entombed at Bethel. Some theologians believe that he was actually moved, like Joseph was, back up to Shechem. So we don't know for sure whether th Stephen was wrong or not. It didn't quite jab with Genesis. It perhaps was accurate. But finally the time came for God to do what he had promised Abraham. By then the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Another king was ruling Egypt, and he didn't know anything about Joseph. He tricked our ancestors and was cruel to them. He even made them leave their babies outside so they would die. Sounds like somebody leaving their baby in the car to me. In the King James it says, In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up his father's house three months. So three month old baby and they put him in a little ark type craft with pitch and tar so it wouldn't sink and left his sister Miriam out there to watch over it and then along came Pharaoh's daughter. And so later as we see Moses has gone through ups and downs and actually killed a man. I was in line in the bank uh, about 30 years ago, back in the 90s, and I was reading the newspaper, and someone was talking about how we shouldn't let people out of jail who had murdered someone. I didn't say they shouldn't go to jail, but after time, yeah, maybe if they have been rehabilitated, 
we should check that out and we should get them out. I do think they need to go to jail if they've been killing somebody. I really do. Uh, we need to continue to show folks if you do these hateful things, then yeah, we need to lock you up and not let you out here with good, decent folks. All right? Holy ground is where Moses found himself and God told him to take his shoes off. Well, where was Moses? He was on Mount Sinai, but this was the place that he had already been uh, herding the cattle that belonged to his father-in-law. Now, this was where he lived his life. And yet Moses didn't know the place he lived every day was holy ground. The places we live every day, our houses, our jobs, our schools, the streets we drive to and fro on, the churches we come into, the stores we enter, the businesses we frequent, that's holy ground. Be careful how you act at the place where you live. We need more people to start looking at that the ground that those boys, those boys followed the, 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 the Christian minister who was buried today to her house and murdered her in her front yard. That was her holy ground. Everywhere we go is holy ground, and we need to start remembering that. God said, I am the God who was worshipped by your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses started shaking all over and didn't dare to look at the bush. The Lord said to him, take off your sandals because the place where you are standing is holy. With my, with my own eyes, I have seen the suffering of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Now I'm sending you back to Egypt. Now, Stephen didn't get into it, but Moses went into this whole diatribe about how he couldn't speak clearly. And every time I study the Bible and all the theology I read on that, that whole session, God never said Moses couldn't speak clearly. There was no evidence that Moses couldn't speak clearly. If you look in the Pentateuch and all those big sermons he, said, he, he gave, he never stumbled. And God placated him by saying, I'll send your, your brother Aaron to be a, a, a mouthpiece for you. Aaron didn't do much talking for Moses. In fact, it caused Aaron and Miriam to rebel against their baby brother Moses because they were older. I know Miriam was. I can't remember whether Aaron was older than Moses or not. But they rebelled against him, and then Moses had to beg God not to kill him. He gave Miriam leprosy, and God cleaned it up after Moses kept pleading over it. But a lot of times, we say we can't do things, and it's in our own head because if God is with us, like the two spies that came back, Joshua and Caleb, and told the people, you know, wait a minute, what do you mean we can't do this if God is with us? What do you mean we can't take the land because the walls of the cities are too tall and the people are giants? What do you mean there's so many of them that we can't do it? Of course we can do it when God is with us. Moses spoke clearly. He said he didn't speak clearly. God never said Moses didn't speak clearly. What is it that you're saying you can't do that you're lying to you and you're lying to me and anybody else that wants to listen? I don't want to hear it, okay? Because if God be for us and he has continually showed us, he is what? For us. Yeah, it can be done. And this is one of the things that I heard. I've been watching these sports documentaries lately and uh, can't, his name escapes me right now, but the young man who played shortstop for the New York Yankees for 20 years. They called him the captain because he was the 11th captain of the New York Yankees. As old as that fan, uh, what, is, what is his name, Deacon? Jeter. Jeter, Derek Jeter. Uh, his parents did not allow his sister and he to say, I cannot. It was not allowed in his household. So too often we have folks telling us, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. Derek Jeter's mom and dad had told him, yeah, you can. And from the time he was a little boy, when he could barely remember anything, he always wanted to play shortstop for the New York Yankees. And that boy, did he play shortstop for the New York Yankees? I think they won the championship five or six times. And he's lived a very good life and continues to live one, married now with three beautiful daughters. And so the bottom line is, we need to be telling each other, yes, with the help of the Lord, I can. Yes, with the God-given ability that I have, I can. And with new ability that I'm going to be able to acquire because God is going to help me to study and study and study and strengthen myself, yes, I can. Hey, Moses spoke real well. He could. 
I have seen the affliction of my people. This Moses whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and deliver by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Remember where we live is holy ground. Now, Stephen begins to shift as we get toward the end of our lesson this evening. He says, but the most high God didn't live in houses made by humans. It is just as the prophet said when he spoke for the Lord. In 49 in the King James Version says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, said the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things, God is saying? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Not talking about a, a circumcision of our genitalia, but in our heart it's time to prune some of this excess baggage that we continue to too often carry. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. We who are fathers and mothers and yet to be fathers and mothers, be careful. You know, some of my children's worst habits were things I had stopped doing by the time they were born. Wow. One of my best friends will say to you, be careful, it's in the blood, it's also in the spirit. Be careful of these spiritual examples that we give to people that look up to us. And they'll see us leading a crowd, talking about killing somebody, and thinking, yeah, that's what we ought to do. No. That ain't what God wants us to do. And even if we kill somebody physically or not, maybe we just put our mouth on them so bad that it makes it so hard for them to do what God has called them to do that it really makes it difficult. Okay? It's difficult enough as it is to minister to God's people, and we need a lot of ministry right now. There's a lot of folks that need help today. Some of them got all the food and stuff they need. They just need to be encouraged. Pick up the phone and call somebody and say something good to them. Hey, brother boy, I was just thinking about you. Hey, sister girl, she might be 90 years old. She might be 60 years old. She might be 20. Let them know in a good, positive way. I was thinking about you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now the betrayers and murderers. You stubborn and hard-headed people, you are always fighting against the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors did. Is there one prophet that your ancestors didn't mistreat? They killed the prophets who told about the coming of, of the one who obeys God, and now you have turned against him and killed him. They killed Stephen, y'all, okay? And just like they're talking here, they killed Jesus. And this is what made them mad at Stephen. This is why they're going to kill him. And how many times have people ministered to us, whether they were in the pulpit or out in the pew, and we still tried our best to destroy them? And then we wonder why we have trouble growing the church. And y'all, in times like these, we need to grow the church. We need people to see a different way. Because a lot of stuff we're doing right now in these streets, it is not working well for a lot of folks. And if you get in the line of fire, when they start throwing bricks, better known as bullets, it is not a good place to be. We have got to get people to see a different way of living. Right now, we've got to become more effective and efficient, like Stephen helped those who served the tables to be able to do. Angels gave you God's law, but you still don't obey it. Ye who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Have we kept it? Here's the final words that they gave to the, to the stubborn. Their fathers have persecuted the prophets who foretold the coming of Christ all throughout the history of God's relationship as he talked, as Reverend Purifor said on Sunday. Through Abraham's family, family, the whole world would be blessed. And that is Jesus Christ. Now they betrayed and murdered this just one. Nothing more needed to be said. His message was one of God's final words to the Jewish nation 
before the gospel started moving out to the Gentiles. One of these days, God's going to say a final word to us. Will we hear it? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But, he said, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into the heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. You ever been attacked by a mob? I have. Okay? I had eight boys decide at one time they were going to kill me. Yeah. The only thing that got me out of it was the Lord. And the Lord convinced me I needed to tell them that I can hurt one of you before all eight of you hurt me. Nobody wanted to be the one I was going to take. <laughs> okay? And poor Stephen didn't have that opportunity because they stood there with rocks. And it's a frightening thing when a mob comes for you. Sometimes a mob will come for you and they don't bring rocks that are solid out of stone. They bring rocks that are words and lies. Talk to me now. And they cast him out of the city. They didn't do it in the city now, okay? Rome might not have liked that because, you know, only Rome could condemn somebody to death. So the hooligans, the, the lynch mob, took him out like this uh, crowd tried to do in Columbia, Tennessee, to Thurgood Marshall in 1946 when he was there to, con uh, to defend some men for defending their own African-American community from being burned to death to, to the ground like they'd done in Tulsa some 20 plus years earlier. And they cast him out of the city and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord, he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Sounds just like what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Some of us do some terrible things. And it's really difficult, but those of us that they do them to, we need to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Saying more plainly, like when the disciples didn't understand when Jesus said that Lazarus was asleep, Jesus said what? Lazarus is dead. The contemporary English verse said, then he died. And whose feet lay at whose feet lay their coats? It was Saul. We need to make sure it's not ours. How many times does a mob come to kill somebody and we stay and do nothing? It's time for us to stop saying and doing nothing. Okay? We, need, we can stop mobs. The Stone of Stephen usually, as was done by Rembrandt here, Rembrandt von Zine. I can't remember the rest of his last name. Actually, Rembrandt is his first name. The rest of his name is pretty complicated. He is known as the most gifted Dutch artist ever. He worked in stone and in paint, obviously. He did this at 19. What a gifted guy. And quite often, Stephen is depicted uh, with this throne up on the upper left there. Sometimes he has a crown on his head. Other times he's looking up, and that depicts God on the throne which Jesus and other angelic beings around him. So we see the mob here. It's really easy to become immoral in a mob. To excite each other up to a fervent pitch, usually based on jealousy, anger, and sometimes just wanting to be a hooligan. Be careful when you catch yourself in a mob and follow a mob. It's like being in a school of fish. You can't tell where you're going. You might be swimming right into the mouth of the belly of a whale. You might be swimming right in on dry land like a guppy and don't know you're going to get eaten up by whatever's up on the coast. Be careful when you catch yourself excited by a mob. 
getting ready to do murder. And especially when they claim they want to do murder in the name of God. But God doesn't waste anything. When this happened to Stephen, that scared a lot of people. And when it scared them, they left Jerusalem and they went all over the known world. You see here in Greece and Macedonia and, and, and Asia and Asia Minor and all over the LGNC, the places that the Roman Empire had ruled and built Roman roads and Roman ports and dredged out ports so they could get ships in and out easily. The word of God exploded after Stephen was the first person martyred and killed. So yeah, folks may do something bad to you, but don't worry about it. God's going God's to make it all right. If not in this life, certainly in the next, and he will use even your death, even the murders we see going on now, we see good things coming out of it. Don't get me wrong. I wish there had been not the murders. I wish Stephen hadn't been, died, hadn't been murdered. But God still sits on the throne. Folks, we're still in a pandemic, and we've got other infections starting now with monkeypox. Be careful out there. Keep to yourselves. Continue to wear a mask. I know we've got lives to live, and we need to get out and be doing things, but when you're out, wear a mask. If you're not vaccinated, oh, my God, we are continuing to pray that you will accept this gift. You tell me one medical doctor that has told you not to be vaccinated, and I'll quit speaking about this. But you're not going to find very many. I only heard one fanatical medical doctor on TV that say you shouldn't be vaccinated. And I'd like to know if he's vaccinated or not. I bet he is. But he'll have the gall to tell you not to do it. Every doctor I've known that I've gone to see, and I regularly go see about three doctors about three times a year. Thank God I don't, I'm not chronically ill, but I'm an old guy. And I need to go in and get the motor checked every, about every few months, okay? Make sure everything's ticking. And so bottom line is, all my doctors say to me, hey, Brother Fryer, you, you vaccinated, right? You double boosted now, right? Yep. And they're telling me there's going to be another booster this fall in September. And if you want to know where the line forms, you just follow me because I'm going to be in line. Because God's got some things he wants me to do. If nothing else, he wants me to sit here and talk to my, my loving wife every day. As long as I can talk to her, I'm going to be whispering in her ear. Hey, girl, you remember how I used to talk to you about, about 40 years ago? Yeah, I, yeah, we, we talk like that. We always did talk like that too, okay? So bottom line is, God's got things he wants you to do. And whatever it is he wants you to do, you need to be here to do it. You can't be here if you volunteer to die from COVID when he's already sent something to save us from COVID. So yeah, a lot of people are getting COVID, but if you got vaccinated, like President Biden, he got it twice. Some people get it twice when they take that uh, antiviral drug, but he didn't go to the hospital. And the only difference is, if you go to the hospital, you can get much sicker and you can have a higher chance of death. We don't want you to die. We want you here for your family, your loved ones, and equally important for the things that God wants you and has ordained for you to do. That's all we've got this evening. It's been a blessing always sharing with you and we hope that this helps you. We're praying for you. This is an exciting time at our church. This is an exciting time in the world right now. God is doing some really wonderful things despite all the attacks that people are doing in the name of Satan. God is still doing some mighty things in this world. German attitude of prayer. Dear God, we thank you today for your word and we thank you for the many millions of things that people are doing to bless each other in your name. Thank you for the story for tonight from Stephen. Thank you for his remembrance of his heritage. And God, help us to remember our heritage, despite wherever it is we may come, whether it be from the big pork chop of Africa, or all over Central and Southern America, whether it be from the Inuits all the way up to the uh, northern frozen parts of North America, whether we came from all over Europe, God, or anywhere in Asia, we thank you today for all of our heritages because we know that you made us and we are here and called according to your purpose. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for looking in on those in need in this world. And thank you, God, for inspiring us to help those who are in need. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good evening.